Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Max Future. Okay, welcome to the iPad Podcast, and this is Lex at Max Future, and today is October 16th, and it's a very interesting week in iPad land. Not because there's big iPad announcements, but rather iOS 5 came out for the iPhone and the iPad. And of course, the iPhone 4S came out, which gives us some insight as to where maybe the iPad's going to. So here we go. This is a chit-chat-free podcast, all iPad talk. Okay, so the big news, I guess, for iPad lovers uh, is that iOS 5 finally came out uh, this week on Wednesday the 12th. And frankly, you know, for me, it was an easy migration to iOS 5. I was running, uh, what, 4.3.5. The only thing I'm missing, though, is I had a jailbroken version of uh, 4.3.5, and I lost the jailbreak. There currently is no uh, jailbreak for iOS 5. And, but it was worth it. I mean, the one thing that I lost is the ability to screen record my iPad. I was using a jailbreak app to screen record iPad. And I would show you my screen recording. Since ne- so now I don't have that. But I can take screenshots. So, here we go. So what are some of the things that I really like in iOS 5 on the iPad as well as the iPhone? Uh, well, I'll tell you, one of the things that I really like is iMessage. iMessage basically allows you to send text messages to anyone else who has iOS 5 running on an iPhone or on an iPod Touch or an iPad. It's not yet integrated with iChat on a Macintosh, but let's put it this way. Up until now, I haven't been really doing text messages, particularly on my iPhone, because I don't like paying the cell carriers for text messaging. On cell phone plans, I guess except for Sprint, the carriers charge you extra even if you have unlimited data plan to get texts. And to me, that's just outrageous. And so I've been trying to avoid any texting. But Apple has found an ingenious way to get around paying for texting by having a new version of the messaging app called iMessage. And I don't think it was on the iPad before. I think it was only I think the Messages app was only on the iPhone because it was a text messaging app. But now we have iMessages on the iPad, so you can text message to anybody else who has an iOS device running iOS 5. And I expect there are lots of people, maybe in your family or friends, who have iOS 5. And so in my case, my wife has an iPhone, and I put iOS 5 on that. And now, uh, since iOS 5 came out, we are now texting each other. Before we weren't texting each other, we were, um, you know, emailing each other or phone calling each other. And now we're mainly just, you know, texting each other. It's great. And so it's great to have that on the iPad. To me, that was one feature of iOS 5 that's fantastic. Another feature, and remember, I I went through the features before last week. Now I'm going to just talk about what, for me personally, is great. The other thing that's great is the new notification center, which you just pull down by pulling down from the top of the iPad. And so the notification center, you can customize. You can go into settings under notifications and, you know, indicate which apps you want to send notifications to the notification center. And so it's great to have all your notifications in one place. So I have, for example, the weather app and the stock app sending notifications, as well as the iMessage or the Messages app, the ma- uh, the mail app, the calendar app. Uh, and it's great because you can just see, you know, information, you know, either messages or information from apps like the weather app or the stock app at a glance. And I suspect more and more apps are going to make themselves available to give notifications to the notification center, and that's going to be highly useful. So to me, that that is a huge plus. Another huge plus, I think, is a game changer, is the wireless mirroring to an Apple TV. 
Now, to me, this is this is called AirPlay mirroring. This is so cool, and it also works with the iPhone 4S. I don't think it works with the iPhone 4. I think the 4S, which has the same uh, processor the, as the iPad 2, can do this. So this is really cool because if you have an I Apple TV, which only costs 99 bucks, and you have it hooked up to a big TV, essentially you could be walking around with an iPad 2 or an iPhone 4S and just on the fly just say, oh, you know what, I want to see this on a big monitor. So the implications of this are huge. It's great for game playing. My son loves to play the Battleship app on the iPad and today I showed him how you can just wirelessly send it to the big TV in my bedroom and he was doing that. He was playing Battleship but watching it up on the big TV. But for presentations this is going to be great. Uh, frankly, I think this turns the Apple TV into just having a zillion apps on it. Because everybody's saying, hey, when are they going to upgrade the Apple TV so that it can run apps? Well, there are some apps on the Apple TV, but frankly, having the AirPlay mirroring with the Apple, uh, the iPad 2 and the iPhone 4S is essentially turning the Apple TV into a, a device that can run apps. And here's why. Because you can stream any app from the Apple, or from the iPad 2 to the Apple TV. So, for example, all these video apps or TV apps that you have on your iPad 2, um, like you can just stream them to your TV versus the Apple TV. So, or, or the game apps, you can play games and essentially they'll be transferred to your TV through the Apple TV. So, to me, that that that's the a next killer feature. Now, another new feature with um, iOS 5 on the iPad is the ability to do Wi-Fi syncing to um, to your computer instead of like connecting it by USB. And you know, I tried that, and I got a little frustrated because I just don't think you get the same transfer speed as you do by connecting by USB because it was kind of slow. I had a lot of stuff to sync up and it just seemed kind of slow and, and it's kind of weird. I wonder why it's so slow because it's hooking up by uh, the end standard of Wi-Fi so you'd think that would be fast. So anyways, some people, I'm going to play around with that more and more. Um, all right, another cool, cool um, feature is um, photo stream using iCloud. Now this is pretty cool. Um, so basically you sign up for an iCloud account which is you just migrate your MobileMe account to iCloud and they give you, if you have already a paid MobileMe account you get 25 gigabytes for a year for free storage, which is great. But if you don't, if you never paid for any MobileMe account, they give you five gigabytes for free. So the way PhotoStream works is you can have pictures taken on any iOS device show up on any other iOS device or your Macintosh in your Apertures uh, program or your iPhoto program. Just go wirelessly to the cloud and then down. Now, I don't think your video gets um, sent that way, so I don't know if it's a great way to sort of back up all your pictures and such. But uh, it is pretty cool if you have like a relative who's got an Apple TV, you could have them maybe sign up to PhotoStream using your Apple account, and thus you could automatically just send them pictures as you take them on your iPad or your iPhone. So to me, those are some of the key highlights. Oh, there's other things that I would put up there in terms of the things that really, you know, I think are worthwhile for upgrading to iOS 5, and that is Safari. Safari is much better in iOS 5. There's a couple of things. One, there's tabbed browsing now. So you can have in the browser various tabs of various page, page, uh, pages on the web. 
The other thing though is you now have um, a reading list. And so if you have a reading list, um, you can save you can save by just pressing uh, shift command D any web page to your reading list and there are these eyeglasses on the left which are your links that you've saved that you want to read later and the beauty is if you sync your iPad with your Mac or other device through iCloud your reading list gets synced so you could create a reading list on one device or computer and it will be showed up on another device or computer now the other thing that I really uh, love is that you have this like reader button uh, in your uh, address bar of your browser and we've already had that on the Mac and now we have that on iPad and that's great and you also have it on the iPhone because you could be reading an article and you press that button and it just looks much much nicer because it's formatted really nicely and um, it, particularly on the iPhone it's fantastic because you know on the iPhone with the small screen it's kind of hard to read but on, on the iPad it's highly useful too because you can just see what you're um, you know reading much better so I would say those features for me are the big like upgrades that are worth it for um, moving from iOS 5 to um, the iPad. Now there's another feature which I think may be a reason for a lot of people to do it which is you don't really need a computer anymore. Once you have iOS 5 on it you can activate an iPad without a computer. So for example let's say you completely wiped your settings of your iPad. Once you have iOS 5 on it you can start up again um, because you don't need you don't need a computer you don't need iTunes and also you don't you can back up to iCloud so you could have all your settings backed up to iCloud and be completely cut from a computer now this is great because there's gonna be a lot of people who just want to use their iPad as their main computer and Apple is basically paving the way for a lot of people to just have an iPad and no computer at all and I think we're eventually gonna go that way now personally I I like backing it up to my Macintosh my iMac I think it's a lot quicker my upload speeds on my cable company are very slow and I'd rather not you know back it up to the cloud because I don't want to use up all that storage I mean I have a lot of devices and if I share one mobile iCloud account I'm gonna have only 25 gigabytes of storage so my iPad for example has 64 gigabytes of storage and my iPhone has 32 gigabytes so I'm gonna chew through that 25 gigabytes pretty quickly so I'd rather back up my devices on my iMac which can you know store like terabytes worth of storage including external drives so um, those are the big the big changes I mean there's hundreds of other changes in iOS 5 that are worthwhile but um, that is the best oh wait another thing that is really cool is that under the keyboard setting you can now go in and uh, add words easily to to um, the dictionary so if, if there are names that you use a lot when you type you you go under the keyboard and under I guess what phrases or something like that shortcuts there's two fields phrases and a shortcut now you can also create a shortcut for a complex f phrase and so let's say you had a the phrase that you wanted to do a shortcut with was um, um, you know I'm out of the office uh, so you could create a shortcut and call it like X, you know, uh, O O T, uh, which is not really a word. And so whenever you type X O O T, uh, iOS and any text field will type "I'm out of the office." But let's say you don't want to create a shortcut. You can add to the dictionary by just adding in that phrase. 
you know, and uh, or like that. I don't know what to say. There's a name in your family that's hard to spell. Well, you just add that name, and it'll always remember it. So there are lots of little gems like that, um, and you know the the list can go on. I mean, the mail app is great now because you can um, you can format text using bold, italic, or underlined fonts. You can create indents. You can drag names and address fields. So, you know, it's basically getting closer and closer to doing, actually, it's in a way, some way, it can do more than what a regular computer does. So anyways, I, I would highly suggest if you have an iPad 2 or iPad that you upgrade to iOS 5. Now, one thing did not come to the iPad, either iPad 1 or iPad 2, with iOS 5 and that is the new Siri function which is in iOS 5 and that Siri function in iOS 5 only currently works in the new iPhone 4S which people started finally getting on Friday October 14th and I got one I upgraded from the iPhone 4 to the iPhone 4S and um, the iPhone 4S has the same processor as the iPad 2, uh, the A5 processor, which has a dual core processor, and it has the same amount of RAM, 500, what is it, 512 megabytes of RAM, so it doesn't have more RAM than the iPad 2, which makes sense. Remember when the first iPad came out, uh, Apple took those specs internally and stuck them in the iPhone 4 so it would make sense that Apple would take the specs in the iPad 2 and stick them in the iPhone for the iPhone 4S and um, it's a great upgrade because the iPhone 4S is so fast but here's the thing the Siri function is fantastic and it currently is only on the iPhone 4S and some people are wondering why did Apple do that because clearly the iPad 2 has the same hardware now the way Siri works is it's a couple of things. It's voice recognition and artificial intelligence. And it works by capturing any sort of natural language voice. And I guess the processor on the iPad or the iPhone 4S does something. And then it goes up to the cloud. So you need an internet connection. But it works in two ways. One, Siri works when you hold the home button down on the iPhone 4S it pops up this Siri interface which is like a microphone button and you can say something and here's where the artificial intelligence comes in it recognizes what you're saying and then it can speak back to you and it has like a female voice and it's wild you can say stuff like um, well I, I said you know call me grumpy Lex and so it it decided to change my name to grumpy Lex it made, made that the nickname that it calls me by or I can say, you know, next time, Siri, next time I'm here, remind me to, you know, check the oven. And it will just naturally then know that when you come back to your spot, you know, geolocation, to remind you to put the oven on. So this is incredibly useful. And the, and the other thing that's useful is the voice dictation. Uh, in the iPhone 4S, um, in the keyboard now, the universal keyboard that pops up, there is a microphone. And the microphone allows you to dictate text into any text field. Uh, and I'm looking at a screenshot here. And basically, this is highly useful because now, you know, everyone's complaining that typing on a touch surface is difficult. Well, this could be a game changer because the... Uh, the dictation is is incredibly good, even in, with ambient noise. And here's the thing: you don't need like a headphone or anything. You just talk to the iPhone, and the dictation is very good. So I actually, um, I I dictated a whole blog post. Let's see if I can find it here. I I did a whole blog post here, just by uh, dictating it into the iPhone 4S. And here's what I said. The Siri function on the iPhone 4S is a game changer. In particular, I like the voice dictation func function that's built into the keyboard. As it's built into the keyboard, it can really be used with any of the apps 
on the iPhone 4S. Now I know that voice dictation has worked well on the Android phones for quite a long time, but the voice dictation on the iPhone 4S is particularly amazing. What is particularly amazing about it is that it handles ambient noise and side noise pretty well and doesn't record it. I've used drag and dictation on the iPhone before, but this Siri function is much better and recognizes words much better. Where people can talk and make noise, this function will replace using the keyboard for typing. In fact, this entire post on Tumblr was dictated using this Siri function on the iPhone 4S. I am sure Google will strive to improve the voice recognition on Android devices. Ultimately, there will be an arms race between Apple, Google, and other handset manufacturers on voice recognition. In the coming years, voice recognition will get better and better at recognizing words and ambient noise situations and also being accurate. We have truly entered a new age in computing. As I said in my previous blog post, this is the fourth paradigm of personal computing. The first paradigm was the introduction of the personal computer in the Apple I and Apple II computers. The second paradigm was the introduction of the graphical user interface and mouse to make personal computers more accessible to everyday people. The third paradigm is obviously touch computing introduced really by the iPhone and the iPad. And now the fourth paradigm is very accurate voice recognition and artificial intelligence as, as introduced by the Siri function on the iPhone 4S. It's truly amazing that this entire blog post was dictated in the iPhone 4S by the Siri function. So the question is, when is this going to come um, to the iPad? Um, that's the question. Well, soon after iOS 5 came out, at least one person successfully ported um, Siri to the iPhone 4. And um, one website called, I guess, Nexus404.com says that iPad 2 and iPhone 4, 4 Siri ports coming soon. And um, I think that makes sense. I mean, the, the post says, Siri, that witty but helpful intelligent virtual assistant demoed by Apple during its iPhone event, is absolutely exclusive on the iPhone 4S, at least for now. Developers are already trying to find ways of bringing the functionality to other iOS 5 devices, and it looks like iPad 2 and iPhone 4 Siri projects are under, under works. You know, now, it's clearly eventually going to come to the iPad 2 because it has the same processor. So why isn't it there already? I think it's because um, Siri's in beta right now. Apple's trying to work out the kinks. And since it uses the, the back end, the, the huge server farms, probably the ones in North Carolina, Apple probably doesn't want a million, you know, zillions of people quickly accessing Siri and sort of roll it out. Now, one way to roll it out is to just allow the recent purchases of the iPhone 4S to get it and activate it. If you immediately let all the people who hold iPad 2s use it, it could just flood the servers. So maybe what Apple's going to do is see how it's working with the new iPhone 4Ss and then open it up to the iPad 2 and then maybe the iPhone 4 if Apple can see that its servers can handle the load because people are sort of going nuts with um, with um, you know with um, the Siri on the iPhone 4s and I don't know so maybe they're just um, worried there's gonna be a flood uh, personally I can see this it, it works so well I mean I've been just using it um, playing around with it um, it works so well I just I think it has to come to the iPad too and it's a great way to replace a lot of typing that's what I find really cool about it now, speaking of the future of the iPad, um, there's a story going around now that one analyst is saying, one securities analyst from Ticonderoga Securities named Brian Wright, White is saying that um, there's a rumor from component suppliers in Asia that Apple is going to come out with a smaller, less expensive iPad in 2012. And basically... You know, the reason to do that would be to compete with the Kindle Fire, Amazon's $200 color slate that's supposed to start uh, shipping in November. Now, remember, the iPad 2 starts at $500. So what do you think? Do you think that Apple will do that? 
I think it might make sense. I think having something bigger than the iPhone but smaller than the iPad might be appealing to a lot of people, particularly people who like to like, you know, read while mobile and think that the iPad screen or the iPhone screen or the iPod touch screen is too small. I think the the bigger question though is um how how can Apple make in uh, an, an iPad that's smaller, let's say seven inches, and price it uh, at two hundred dollars. Here's why: Look at the iPod Touch. The iPod Touch, the eight gigabyte model, which has the same amount of gigabytes as the iPad. I'm sorry, the uh, the the Kindle Fire, Amazon's Kindle, is the same price now as the Kindle Fire, one hundred ninety nine dollars. Now Apple dropped that price. It used to be 220, and I think Apple dropped it because it has specs very close to the Kindle Fire. So, how could how can Apple come out with a seven-inch iPad for the same price? Why would people pay $200 for an eight-gigabyte iPod Touch that's small if, for the same price, they can get an iPad that's like seven inches in size? I guess some people would want it for the mobility. So this is a real quandary for Apple because the quandary is what do you do with the iPod Touch in terms of price? If Apple drops that price to let's say a hundred bucks for an iPod Touch, what kind of margin does it get? So, but here's what I'm thinking. What if Apple comes out with an iPad that's seven inches but has limited functionality? What if it has only eight gigabytes of storage, no camera, and iBooks, and it can't really play games or play music? It's just for reading, surfing the web, and um, getting magazines and stuff like that. Then maybe they could sell it for the same prices as the iPod Touch because it wouldn't cannibalize the iPod Touch as much. The iPod Touch would be to have music and have the whole sort of iPhone 4, iPhone 4S experience without, you know, without um, the phone in it. So Apple's in sort of a quandary, and it would be interesting to see what sort of device it could come out with that would compete with the size of the Kindle Fire or Kindles, but without destroying its margins. Okay, so one of my favorite apps on the iPad is the Flipboard app, which is um, basically like a, like a social networking newspaper app in the sense that it takes feeds from, it scrapes like information from magazines and newspapers, but also scrapes information from your Twitter account or Facebook account and gives it a sort of a magazine style experience where you can flip through all this information. And they've been sort of at odds with some of the major newspapers who've claimed that they're illeg illegally, you know, taking content. But some newspapers are playing with them, and um, one is USA Today. And this week, uh, according to MobileBurn.com, USA Today announced on Sunday, October 16th, that it is the first national newspaper to have its content featured on the popular Flipboard application. And basically, a selection of top stories from USA Today will be featured on the app, uh, which presents news. And um, the quote here from Flipboard is, We are delighted to offer USA Today on Flipboard. Our readers are busy, social. Oh, this is the USA Today people. And on the go, USA Today is their trusted source. So I wonder if this is a trend that we're going to see. The USA Today is not putting all of its content on Flipboard. But maybe the trend will be to put some content, maybe the New York Times will do it, Wall Street Journal, to then entice people to go to the magazines or the newspapers for more full content. So that's going to be an interesting development. Okay, so to get a sense of times are changing and how the iPad's becoming a norm, one of the stories that really got around the web uh, this week or today is how a baby didn't know what to do with a real magazine and thought it was like the iPad. And uh, PCWorld.com, I guess, had a video of this too. And the story from PC World is, for this iPad using baby 
paper does not compute. And it goes on to say um, that someone named Jean-Louis uploaded a video to YouTube that demonstrates how this one-year-old, how his one-year-old daughter has been shaped by the iPad. In the video, she's pretty slick at navigating around the tablet, but hand her a magazine and she's almost clueless. While she can turn the pages, she tries to swipe, pinch, and tap to navigate each sheet. Um, so that's kind of interesting, and it kind of makes sense. It really comes down to what you're used to. And, um, you know, it's kind of cool. I mean, let's see if we can see a little bit of the, um, you know, what happens here. But you can see the, the kid, if you're looking at the video version of this, the kid is swiping through the video, but then on the newspaper, the kid seems a little confused on how to navigate. So it's interesting. I mean, I do think you're, as you see tablets become ubiquitous, people are going to lose, or new, new people like babies and kids are going to lose the skills on how to hand or handle paper-based tablets, which are books and magazines. Now, one thing that's going on in a sort of business sense is that Apple's been sort of at war with Samsung and other tablet manufacturers in patent disputes and um, copyright and, I guess, trademark disputes. In particular, you know, Apple's claiming that Samsung has been sort of ripping off the iPad with these Galaxy tabs. And Samsung then tried to sort of get some leverage in its battle with Apple by countersuing and trying to get Apple banned from selling the iPhone and iPad in various countries, including the Netherlands. But um, Samsung lost recently because Samsung's been relying on some patents that involved what are known as uh, FRAND terms, or fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. In other words, industry standard patents. And... Um, Anyway, Samsung sought from Apple, uh, the, what the court said was what, what Samsung sought from Apple was far out of step with the obli obligation to make a FRAND offer that can be concluded that Samsung is not generally prepared to enter a FRAND license agreement with Apple. In other words, if you have these sort of FRAND patents, you can't say, I'm not going to give them to someone. you got to offer them to everybody in the industry. So, and this had to do with, I guess... Um, 3G technology, you know, not really something peculiar to the iPad, but just sort of 3G telecommunication, telecommunications technology. So this was kind of a blow for Samsung, at least. They, they lost some leverage against Apple. Now, Apple did score some victories against Samsung in its battle, you know, over the iPad and the Galaxy. In the United States, in its lawsuit against Samsung to get a preliminary injunction, a U.S. judge said that Samsung's Galaxy tabs infringe Apple's iPad patents. But the court added that Apple has a problem establishing that the validity of its patents in its latest courtroom face-off. So it's unclear what's going to happen. Now, other news is that um, Apple got an injunction against Samsung in Australia on patent violations. So... You know, I have sort of mixed feelings about this. On one hand, I think, you know, Apple should protect its intellectual property. On the other hand, I like to see competition. So, you know, I guess ultimately I'm an investor in Apple, not in Samsung. I would prefer Apple, you know, defending its patents. Uh, and ultimately, look, Amazon, sh I mean, uh, Samsung should find a way to innovate without, you know, coming so close to Apple's design and technology. So, anyways, this is all kind of a sideshow into, you know, what really counts is how these devices work. Okay, so one of the new features in iOS 5 on the iPad and the iPhone is there's now a newsstand app. And it's basically an app, which is really a folder made by Apple, that really, it's a place for you to, you know, buy... Uh, magazines and newspaper apps and one of the first uh, I guess or one of the new additions to this newsstand app is the guitarist and so there's a story out by Music Radar uh, in which I guess the guitarist magazine 
has now a deluxe edition for iPad and it's available as a free preview on the Apple newsstand. So if you're interested in guitars or just want to see how the newsstand works, you should go check out the Guitarist Deluxe Edition for iPad, which is the preview. And, um, and basically, the editor of that magazine says, quote, This is hugely exciting as it provides the perfect medium to engage with our readers on a higher level, showcase our world-class quality photography, specialist tutorials, and exclusive celebrity interviews. We've included a fantastic blend of audio and visual effects with the same great content you find in print magazines. So I wonder if this newsstand app, because it'll be a sort of an organized place to get your subscriptions of magazines and newspapers, if that'll cause more magazines and newspapers to publish on the iPad. Um, you know, it's certainly, I think it, I, I like this because I, I like the fact that there's one place I can get this content as opposed to hunting for it in the app store. Now, a very prominent newspaper, Los Angeles Times, sort of picked up on the same thought I had about how fantastic Apple's iMessage app was. Um, and it has an article out this week entitled, uh, Apple's iMessage texting service takes aim at wireless carriers. It came out on the 13th by Shan Lee and Nathan Oliveris Giles from the LA Times. And basically they point out what I've said, which is iMessage really is just an incredible way to send free text without paying the carriers. And um, they basically, um, you know, point out to the masses that this is a great, great utility. And I think that's reason enough to, you know, upgrade to iOS 5. Now the iPad, particularly the iPad 2, is a fantastic gaming device and it looks like it's getting even better as a gaming device as one of the greatest um, game franchises is coming to the iPad 2 as well as the iPhone 4S. Look, as these devices get more powerful and have more powerful processor, the games can get better. And Apple Insider has a story out on Friday, October 14th pointing out that Grand Theft Auto 3 is coming to the iPhone 4S and iPad 2. What the article by Chris Smith says is that Rockstar Games will bring its popular Grand Theft Auto franchise um, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the game's third episode. And uh, apparently the company that makes Grand Theft Auto announced on Thursday that Grand Theft Auto 3 will be coming to select new generations of iOS devices this fall, specifically citing iPhone 4S and iPad 2. So, um, I mean, this is kind of very exciting, I think, for kids uh, or teenagers who like the game. I mean, it's kind of violent and, um, you know, it should be kind of cool to see how well it plays on the iPad. Uh, it's a huge franchise that's existed on other gaming platforms, and so it'll be very cool to see it on the iPad. It just sort of solidifies the iPad's position as a great gaming device. Now, we know the iPad is a great enterprise uh, device, and the New York Times further confirms that it's a great enterprise device in the medical community. And uh, we previously talked about how doctors and hospitals are using it. The New York Times on October 15th had a very interesting article in the Business Day section entitled, Those Scan Results Are Just an App Away. The article is by Ann Eisenberg. And um, she's got some interesting interviews and of people developing medical apps. And basically, um, there's a doctor named Patrick Gangon um, who has um, an app that was cleared by the Food and Drug Administration. According to the article, Dr. Gagnon, who's a radiation oncologist, uses the app when he sees patients in his Fairhaven, Massachusetts office. He pulls his iPhone out of his pocket, and then he and the patient side-by-side -side can view images on it and discuss treatment. And the app is called Mobile MIM. It's made by a company called MIM Software. 
and can turn an iPhone or iPad into a diagnostic medical instrument. It also apparently allows physicians to examine scans and make diagnoses based on magnetic resonance imaging. So this is pretty wild technology. Uh, I mean, if doctors are using it in such way. Um, so it says here that mobile MIM was the first medical imaging act app to be cleared by the agency. So isn't that wild? The Food and Drug Administration is going to be clearing apps that can be used in medicine. You know, maybe Apple should be doing a deal with the FDA, have some FDA people embedded at Apple in approving medical apps. Um, I'm just joking on that. Um, it says here the FDA clearance for the mobile MIM app took nearly two and a half years. Uh, and they said that one concern the agency had was that ambient lighting under which scans might be read when using the app. Studies are usually read on workstations in the low light of, of reading rooms. And um, they were concerned that doctors using the cell phones or tablets on the go might find themselves in places that are far brighter than, than that. Huh. So... Um, I guess one of the solutions they designed into the app was software that includes an automatic test for poor lighting. Users must perceive and tap a small rectangle that appears faintly on the screen. If you can't see the rectangle and touch it, you are in an area that's too bright. So this is kind of interesting. I mean, we're seeing, you know, the iPad and the iPhone, I guess, in cockpits of airplanes, and now we're seeing it for really important medical procedures and functions. Very cool. Okay, so if you're a big Dropbox box fan and you're also excited by Apple rolling out iCloud, well, things have gotten better for you and have gotten better for anybody who likes cloud storage, particularly on their iOS devices. Well, there's a company, I mean, I haven't really used them before, but others have, called Box.net, and they provided sort of a cloud storage for the iPhone and iPad, but they've done something truly stunning. Um, they this week announced that they're going to offer 50 gigabytes of free cloud storage for anyone who uses Box personal account on the iPhone or iPad. And um, it says here, I'm looking on the website crn.com, that um, the Box offer offers free cloud storage on the iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch, and um, you know you get 50 gigabytes. So this is pretty cool. I mean, um, you know, you can store a lot there. Now I don't know if you'd really want to store that much. What you're going to store are mainly documents, I take it. Um, but it it's pretty cool. Uh, so check it out. Okay, so if you go to box.net and check it out, I mean, they do have paid accounts, but, you know, if you look under prices, they, sh they do have web storage for up to 50 gigabytes for free for one user. Now, the file size limits for the free account are 25 megabytes to 1 gigabytes in size. That's pretty big. The access to it is limited to mobile app access, not to, like, a computer. Uh, and fire, file sharing links. So that's, you know, they're going to sort of save some, you know, data by not allowing your computer to back up there. Now, um, um, I don't know. It seems pretty, pretty cool. Um, it's a, it's a great way to sort of ramp up the competition. Uh, now you can, um, Hmm. You can get, well, that's like an old information, but it looks like, it looks like, um, you get free up to 50 gigabytes. So pretty cool. Check it out. Box.net. Now the, um, Android tablets haven't been really doing that well. And, um, an article came out that said Google's Honeycomb offensive musters just 3.5 million tablets. Honeycomb is the current latest 
tablet operating system for Android devices slash gear.com had this article and it basically says Apple's iPad may be sitting pretty at the top of the consumer tablet charts but questions still remain over whether Android 3 Honeycomb really has been a sales failure so far and it says Google and its manufacturer partners are yet to announce official sales figure for tablets running Android leaving us dependent on supply chain rumors and guesstimates um, so it says it may be that Google sold 3.4 million altogether or, or 3.4 million devices have shipped with Honeycomb and um, you know that's not really a huge amount um, you know compared to a Apple's sales um, so we'll have to see um, you know it's interesting today I was out for a kids party and there were some people at the in the in the party at where we went to and one guy was showing off an Asus tablet which I guess is pretty cheap and doesn't cost that much and he was just sort of raving about how great it is it could do all these things like download files but as he was showing it off to somebody I was looking at the screen and the screen looked terrible it looked very sort of washed out and poor and so I just wonder how many people are buying these M Android devices um, it's unclear but look eventually the competition will maybe get better and better and you know and that'll put pressure on Apple to try to stay ahead okay so now that the iPhone 4s has come out now the rumors are starting to start about production on the iPad 3 and uh, a website called TG Daily uh, came out with a story on October 14th the very day that the iPhone 4s started arriving in people's hands that said um, that Saskia Sesquihana financial analyst Jeff Fidicaro has told allthingsdigital.com that Apple's supply chains have been ramping up to create 12 million to 14 million iPads and um, that work is I guess starting on the iPad 3 so you know according to the report Apple's already worked on production of the iPad 3 and that's what the they're gearing up to do well of course Apple's working on the iPad 3 I think it's kinda ridiculous that these analysts you know are getting this information like it's a big surprise like obviously Apple you know the iPad 2 came out in April the iPad 1 came out the April before obviously an iPad 3 is gonna come out next year maybe not in the spring maybe in the fall but it's gonna come out so I just think it's kinda ridiculous that these analysts like act like like their intelligence is such a clever and big thing uh, you know obviously Apple's working behind the scenes on new products and obviously there's gonna be a new iPad 3 obviously there's gonna be another iPhone coming out next year at some point you know that's called progress now, things to note in terms of iPad apps are that GQ has released something for the iPad called GQ style manual and it's described as this best selling style manual is a collection of our most indispensable fashion advice now in app form you'll have access to the rules of head to toe style wherever you are download the app and buy it now GQ the app is free but of course there is you know in app purchases ranging uh, from GQ magazine maybe a subscription I think for $19.99 or one edition for $1.99 but GQ style man, uh, manual is six dollars and ninety nine cents. So you you download the app and then you can buy the GQ style uh, manual. Uh, so one year subscription is a nineteen ninety nine. Now one month subscription is two dollars or a dollar ninety nine. And um, you know more and more we're seeing this sort of content. Okay, so another app to get that's free that comes from Apple um, is Find My Friends. Apple released this app that works both, I guess, on the iPhone as well as the um, iPad. And basically, it's like a geolocation app to find your friends. And here's the description. It says, 
Find My Friends allows you to easily locate your friends and family from your iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch. Install this free app on your iOS 5 device and sign in with the Apple ID you use with iCloud. Adding a friend is easy. Just send a request to see their location. Once your friend accepts using the Find My Friends app, you will then be able to see that friend's location on a list or a map. You can also choose to share your location for a limited time, a, limit, limit, a limited period of time with a group of friends. That's kind of cool. So I haven't st started playing with this. I've always used Find My iPhone to help find family members with the iPhone. The features include easy locate friends and family, temporary sharing options, simple privacy controls, parental restrictions, and it's free for the iPad as well as the iPod Touch and iPhone. So if, you, if, if you've if you upgraded to iOS 5, I encourage you to get this. It's kind of a cool way to find not only your family, but friends of yours. And um, it's in English as well as Arabic, Catalan, Chinese, Croatian, Czech, Danish, Dutch. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of countries and uh, languages. So check it out. It's a new app from Apple. Okay, so another free app from Apple that you probably should check out that you can uh, download and it works with your iPad as well as the iPhone and iPod Touch is the iTunes Ma Movie Trailers app. And it's a free app and it basically allows you an easy way to watch movie trailers. And this is what Apple says, it, it, that the app puts the newest and most exclusive movie previews in HD in your hands, browse trailers, clips, and featurettes for the biggest hot Hollywood blockbusters and independent cinema, view stunning HD photos, explore a year-long calendar of movie releases, find showtimes near you, and get ticket info directly from your iPad or iPhone. So, you know, I wonder, though, if this app is going to eventually allow you to buy tickets because uh, that could really cut into what is it fandango and movie phone but i bet you that's the next step because think about it if you could buy movie tickets through your app account you know apple would get a cut of that it'd be easy for you to buy tickets i bet you that's going to kind of come eventually but check this out it's a really cool looking app it's free i mean it's a great way to sort of browse what movies there are on your ipad and again, it's free, and it's from Apple. Very cool. Now, there's a new DJ app in the App Store for the iPad. Now, I've been playing around and using DJ, which is spelled D-J-A-Y, on the iPad, and it's kind of cool. It's a DJing app where you've got two platters of records, and you can you know sort of mix songs, and it's kind of cool. But there's a new one out now, and uh, it's also kind of pricey, $19.99, called Mixer, M-I-X-R. And um, here's what it says. Mixer delivers a rich feature set designed for mobile DJs. You can pinch, pitch, tap to tempo, scratch, multi-cue, and mix with precision. You can manage your iPod library with the revolutionary crate manager, make crates with the touch of your finger and the drag-and-drop interface, you have complete control over your mixes, feature high quality DSP effects. You can add delay and reverb to your mixes to add that extra punch to your set, supporting mono split audio output. Put. You can monitor pre queuing with your headphones. You can record your mixes and play them back in Sleek Player. Now, I haven't downloaded this, I have DJ, and uh, it looks like it has a lot of the same features. Um, similar layout in the screenshots to record players side by side and um, I don't know the, the ability to create crates looks kind of cool but you know what I'd like to see for a DJing app is something that doesn't try to recreate what a real DJ outfit looks like in the real world but rather uses the you know the iPad interface for something totally modern that doesn't look like it's replicating real life. I mean, I think when you start trying to replicate hardware on the iPad, you run into limits. But if instead you just think of a new way to be a DJ, why do you have to create a picture of a record? Why not just create an interface that is, you know, quick to use and very useful? 
And because ultimately for DJing, it's what people hear. People don't see what's on the iPad screen when you're DJing. So anyways, the, you know, these are kind of gimmicky. It's 20 bucks. I wouldn't really advise getting it unless you really have some money to burn and like to, you know, play around with different uh, DJing apps. Okay, so final note, in California, today is officially Steve Jobs Day. Uh, Governor Brown declared it so. And uh, it's nice that there's a Steve Jobs Day. I wonder if this will become a sort of a national event. Uh, obviously, he has a lot to do with, you know, the iPad. If you think about it, he was probably the big mo motivator in getting that out. He's, you know, he was the motivator for really transforming the personal computer business. And I think we owe it to him that we have an iPad. I'm sure other people thought about it, but... You know, he's the kind of guy who could tell the board, no, I know this is the future. I know we should bet big on it. And, um, you know, it's sad that he's gone. He died at a very young age, 56. God knows what he would have been able to produce if he lived to 70 or 80. So, anyways, um, you know, um, we'll have to see how Apple does without him. I think... For the next few years, Apple should be doing fine uh, because there's a lot that was in the pipeline probably uh, that Steve Jobs put into the pipeline and he has very able people around it, around him. But the real trick is what's Apple going to be like 10 years from now? But hey, that's a long time. And so let's just call it a day and I'll see you next week. So thanks for listening. This is a Chit Chat Free Podcast, all things Apple iPad. Take care. This has been a Max Future Production.